I would just counsel anybody in the same situation. Don't ever think that pressing charges is a bad thing because what you fail to realize is you can't say if I press charges my relationship will get worse. Think about the situation you're in. If you're already physically assaulted, emotionally injured, or mentally traumatized by your partner, you're already in such a bad place in your relationship, you may be holding on to something that just you shouldn't be holding on to any further. Uh, in my 18-year relationship, the, the first domestic violence incident occurred 11 months in. And in that one particular situation, uh, I was actually driving my car on the 401 and in the middle of an argument. And uh, out of the blue, my partner actually reached across the front seat and punched me, uh, fracturing my nose uh, in the middle of traffic in the express lanes of Highway 401. And that was less than a year after I'd been married. Um, I have records to support that and, and you know hindsight is twenty twenty. When I look back and think, okay, and I've told people, I've been through all kinds of counseling about, you know, the challenges in my relationship, my own challenges, things that I could have done differently. But what I've I've had done a lot of work on why is it that that wasn't a warning sign to you and, and you thought that was acceptable. That's something that I think we as men and domestic violence victims in general need to look at is we can't accept that this is normal or this is going to go away. I should have seen that as a red flag. Um, there were times when I would ha when I had to, I would say, if I were to, to recall, I would say probably six or seven incidents in the course of that 18 years. Uh, probably, let's say, no more than 10. But in those 10 instances, and I can think of each one of them right now, I either made up stories to tell my friends, I made up stories to cover for what had happened to me because in each one of these cases there, were, there was physical evidence. I either, I, I've worn makeup before to cover uh, blemishes or cuts on my face. Um, I've actually worked from home and avoided work so as not to go in and have to be accountable for what happened to me. Uh, I've made up stories for my kids, I've made up stories for friends to cover up what had happened. I did that because I either wasn't aware of a place where I could go and share this. I thought, I never shared with my friends, and I have a really tight group of, of great friends that have been friends for a long time. I never shared with them, and I think this is something that we as men need to be able to overcome. This happened once when there were people in my home. Friends of mine were downstairs in the basement. I go upstairs because my wife and I were obviously arguing. I go upstairs, I come back downstairs, and I actually had cuts and welts on my face. And I remember making up a story about having fallen into a closet. I remember I went to, uh, the worst incident of domestic violence was one that was witnessed by uh, one of my children. And uh, I was on my way to uh, a three-day meeting, an off-site, and I was leaving about 7.30, quarter to 8 in the morning. And by the time I was shaken by the experience, I got chased around the house, chased around the main floor, chased around the dining room table. And I actually had um, 13 open wounds on my face because my partner had not chosen to use an object. My partner chose to use her fingernails. And every single time, with rare exception, every single time there was domestic abuse against, domestic violence against me, it was always on my face. And sometimes it was a surprise attack and sometimes it was something I could see coming. I was shaken to the core. I had to drive two and a half hours and then do an all day presentation. And I'll never forget, I, I tried putting makeup on, but the blood kept coming through the makeup. And I stopped twice at Shoppers Drug Marts on the way to, uh, to where I was headed. Um, and at the last place, I remember how embarrassed I was. I actually walked into one of the cosmeticians or cosmetologists, the ladies at the cosmetic counter, and I said, can you help me? Can you put something on here that will prevent the bleeding? And I remember her asking me, what is it, what is it that just happened to you? And I said, don't ask, I just need help. By the time I got there, I realized that the blood on three of the wounds would still just keep seeping out and it looked worse. So I took all the makeup on, walked into a meeting of all my peers and other executives at the company I work with, and had to stand at the front of the room and present. Obviously, I was shaken. I was not myself. I was shaken in my boots. I was white. I was probably still in shock. And I had open wounds on my face. Nobody asked any questions. So I had no forum to share other than uh, fortunately, a family and a really good family friend that I shared with. As a man, 
I was probably ashamed and embarrassed that I would have had to tell somebody about that story. So throughout the course of my relationship, I had opportunity to call 911 on more than two occasions where I initiated the call because I was concerned for my safety. Um, both my son and I slept with uh, objects that would make noise behind our doors in the event, just in the event somebody opened the door in the middle of the night, we were concerned. Now I can't say that I was concerned somebody was going to come in and take violent physical action against us, but I can tell you that having had a history of, of verbal abuse and physical abuse, I was not comfortable towards the in the last two years of the relationship, I was not comfortable sleeping in the guest room without something behind the door that would either impede the progress of someone coming in or at the very least alert me to the fact that somebody was coming in the room. And I think anybody, male or female or a child, think about my son's case, any a child that has to go to bed putting objects behind their door because they're worried about who's going to come in and what's going to happen in their bedroom, this is just anxiety and abuse that nobody needs to live with and nobody should tolerate. One of the one of the other things that happened in my relationship was I'm a sound sleeper. No matter what's going on in the relationship or in my life or at work, when I shut down, I shut down. That bothered my partner because my partner would lie in bed beside me when we slept in the same bed and in the master bedroom. My partner would lie beside me and she was the type of person that would go over things and play things over and over and she had a problem sleeping. So on more than one occasion, in fact on multiple occasions, when I would just, after a conversation or whatever had happened that evening, when I would fall asleep in the bed and I would be obviously sleeping soundly like that, my partner was so upset that with, I guess, what she perceived to be the problems in the relationship or things that I hadn't taken care of or things that were still between us, on many occasions my partner would either elbow me, would shove me, or kick me in bed. Uh, out of anger that I could fall asleep and apparently be so comfortable and so at peace with how things were in the relationship. So yeah, on there were occasions when we were sleeping in the same bed when I would be, I wouldn't say punched, but I would be pushed, shoved. I know for a fact I was elbowed. I know that I was kicked. And I know that I was wake, uh, awakened abruptly and frighteningly so on many occasions with my partner screaming at me, yelling at me, call, calling me names. I mentioned calling 911. Um, in the summer of 2014, I called 911 because I was feeling threatened in my home. Uh, I thought that the, the situation at that point was uh, my partner uh, had confronted my son and I in his room. I called 911 because both my son and I were concerned and I had seen this kind of situation escalate into something physical before. And I felt in a small bedroom, I felt it was very possible this could escalate again. I called 911 and uh, the police were on their way. That diffused the situation momentarily, even though there was still some yelling. Interestingly, when the police officers showed up, I answered the door because I was the one that needed the support and I was the one that had made the call. Interestingly enough, when I look back, the way I was treated was, uh, I won't say they accosted me, but I will say they immediately like made sure they moved me over to a corner and they said, you sit down, you be quiet, get over here. I had to go out of my way to convince the police officers that it was me, in fact, who had made the call because I was scared. So it was an interesting eye-opener for me that by default, in some situations, it's possible that it's assumed that the male is the one that's instigating the, the violence, which I think also help makes men repress, you know, why would they go and talk to a group of people? Why would they go to the police? Why would they tell their friends about domestic violence when by default everyone thinks it's the man that, that originates it? I'm willing to bet that had the woman made the call and said, I'm scared for my safety, I'm willing to speculate that there might have been perhaps more aggressive steps taken by the police and perhaps charges laid because as I learned last year, even the concept of fear or the feeling of fear can qualify as assault in a man versus woman scenario. Three weeks after that 911 call, uh, I was working at my office on a Monday middle of the afternoon and I got a call from an unknown number. I picked up the phone and the caller identified themselves as a Metro Toronto police detective. They asked me to leave my office. They asked me to go downstairs and meet them. I met them. They asked me if I knew what, I, what they were there for. I said I have no idea whatsoever. 
They basically told me they were there investigating domestic violence charges against me by my partner. Uh, I got arrested at work uh, in front of coworkers. There were coworkers there, handcuffed and put into a police cruiser in your typical fashion, where they put your hand, their hand on your head and push you into the back seat in a suit and tie at my workplace. Um, and uh, then obviously processed in jail. And I just went through about a, a nine to 11 month ordeal, I'll call it for lack of a better expression, where interestingly enough, with rare exception, the Crown Attorneys, the judges, the pretrial judge, and the judge that actually saw and presided over the case getting thrown out of court, each one of these people in the, in the legal profession or in the legal system that reviewed my case were amazed and couldn't believe that the charges, let's just say they were trumped up, that they couldn't believe that this case would ever even make it into the legal system. How could this happen? But I think there's some onus in the system somewhere to a responsibility that the government feels where they say, okay, just in the event somebody's going to reoffend and there is a shred of evidence or, or possibility here, let's put this person through the meat grinder and through the system anyway, just to say that we did something. Um, and I won't pass judgment on the legal system, but I will say that one of the things that I went through is uh, as part of the case getting thrown out of court and the charges being dropped, one of the things that I had to agree to was anger management. So I went to a 12-week program called the PAR program. And uh, I can tell you that the PAR program changed my life. It didn't change my life because I have, ang I have anger issues that needed to be resolved and it did a wonderful job. It changed my life because it opened my eyes to what I believe to be something that I can, where an area in my life where I can make a difference. 25% of the men in the course with me were in similar situations where they had been charged they might have been the one making the 911 call. They might have been the one receiving the abuse. Yet when the police showed up, because of the toxicity of the situation or the fact that there was so much heat and tension in the room, they actually had to arrest somebody or felt an obligation. And they arrested the man and charged the man with domestic assault. So I really do believe, and when I explored with each one of these men on a weekly basis, why? Did, how did you get where you got to? Everyone had the same experience as me. These men would say to me, why would you stay in a relationship like the one you just described? You were getting, you know, you were physically abused, you had these scars and cuts, and you had to wear makeup, and you had to make up lies and excuses. Your kids saw it. Why did you stay? And I can tell you, the reason I stayed, because at the end of the 12 weeks, I promised them I'd give them an answer. I stayed because I was scared of the unknown. I was scared of change. I was scared of change in my lifestyle. I was scared of what people would think if I had to tell them, well, I left or we ended that relationship and we ended it because I was getting physically abused. I didn't feel comfortable sharing with people why I didn't leave a relationship that was so toxic. Interestingly enough, in four years ago when I had the worst case of domestic violence against me and I had visible and tangible scars and, and wounds to show, I went and saw a lawyer. And the lawyer said, you have 90 days to press charges. And I told this story to the men in the group that I, that I uh, participated in. And that lawyer bothered me every two, bothered me, followed up with me every two weeks and said, are you gonna press charges? Are you gonna press charges? Are you gonna press charges? And I had every reason to press charges. I had the physical evidence, I had eyewitnesses. When I look back now, and I had to answer to these men and say, why didn't I press charges? Why didn't I proceed through the legal system? Quite honestly, I didn't do it for two reasons. One, I didn't think anyone would believe me. And they would say, oh, you're making this up. You're six feet tall. How could this possibly have happened? You let it happen. That's the one reason. And the second reason is when I think about actually going forward and I found out that children's aid would be involved because a child was involved, I actually, and this is where I think my biggest problem was, I was more scared of what my partner would do if I pressed charges. So think about the mind of a man that is physically abused, has tangible, visible wounds, and yet won't go to the authorities. And I'm not scared in any other part of my life. I'm not, I don't, I confront, I have difficult conversations all the time, I confront challenges, I take things head on. In this part of my life, I didn't go to the authorities and didn't take action, which the legal system would have fully supported, because I was more scared of what would happen to me in the recriminations at home after I took that action. That's where I think men need some help to understand violence is violence. You've got to take action when something happens of this nature.
my experience is from the men that I've spoken to in my own personal experience, men do not feel safe or comfortable or confident sharing that they are the victims of domestic violence, physical, verbal, emotional. And I think men feel that society tells them you got to suffer in silence. You have to, you know, you're a man. You should man up on this. You should just deal with it. Let it, you know, have thicker skin. Let it roll off your uh, back like water off of a duck. And I look back at my situation and I believe that I have an obligation to work with groups to make sure that men feel comfortable and have a forum to share and heal safely. And most important to me, again, is I think if we can start minimizing and eliminating any kind of verbal, physical, or emotional abuse, especially where children are exposed to it, then we st not only do we solve problems in relationships, but we solve problems for the next generation of kids who don't have to see that and think it's acceptable. But I honestly think if you feel threatened or you feel your relationship is toxic and it could escalate, and there's any form of verbal, emotional, or physical abuse, I believe that if you at any point feel any fear for your safety in any way, shape, or form, or even that a situation could escalate, I recommend male or female or, or child, I recommend you call 911 to at least get something on the record. Because one of the things that that I know in my particular case, when I had documentation to support hospital visits, to support 911 calls, when I had that documentation and I used it in my legal pursuits to get my name cleared and to get the, the charges dropped, that was something that mattered an awful lot to Crown Attorneys was, this guy can demonstrate a history. In fact, my lawyer opened with that. Uh, you know, they, he would, my lawyer would say to the, to the legal system, there is a history of violence in this relationship and in this marriage. Sadly, the history of violence is against the guy who's got the charges against him. So having that documentation will serve anybody well, male, female, or a child. It'll serve you well that you get it on record. If you're scared, call 911. For the system to change to better service men and uh, families, I think at a minimum, and I think that's one of the reasons that this group that we're, we're working with today makes such a big difference is the message needs to get out there that men are also victims. Whether it's physical, emotional, or verbal, men are victims. What the system needs to do is make sure it's A, crystal clear that men can be victims too. B, make sure that men proactively make sure that men know they have a place to go and there's a place where their voice can be heard and they can actually get help, get healing, and speak with somebody who's either been through it or can help them work through it. And men need to feel comfortable that if they were assaulted, they can press charges. Men need to, I think men need to hear stories similar to mine, not just that mine's the only story. But when I look back, if I were to meet somebody today and they said, oh, my wife did this to me or my partner did this to me, and it, and it qualified as assault, I would tell them immediately, we have to nip it in the butt. Let's help people that are the victims and perpetrators of domestic violence, and let's find a way to eliminate it or minimize the exposure our kids get, because otherwise we're just asking for an entire other generation that has the same problems we have.